want to welcome those of us that have gathered back in. Uh, a little inconvenient with having to log out, log back in, and we'll maybe reassess whether that is going to be necessary in the uh, times going forward. Zoom became so popular that it's probably done a lot of tweaking from the earlier days when we were as a movement using it uh, even. So welcome and uh, I'm going to uh, preface again what it is that the Lord laid on my heart uh, to be doing. Uh, made the decision yesterday <laughs> uh, and uh, plan B. So at any rate, uh, with Elder Parminder's remarks made a, a few Q&A sessions back, I know I was very intrigued by some of the things that he, he brought out. And one of the things that he was saying was in terms of baptisms for the movement, and we're all aware because of COVID-19, the pandemic throughout the world, that uh, it, it sort of struck at a time where several people who were uh, in process of being baptized ended up not being able to logistically. And it has moved from that point of spring 2020 to the point uh, where Elder Perminder was making comment and just encourage, you know, the one-on-one -on -one baptismal vow studying, uh, laying the, the foundation for baptisms hereafter. But what sort of stayed with me and what I've been praying about just for myself is also the, uh, no, Sorry, to start the video as well. Sorry, so you can <laughs> see who you're talking to. Um, anyway, the uh, thought was there, do I need to uh, have one-on-one -on -one studies again? I mean, all of us, I think, that have been baptized did have some studying in group studies and, and so on. And so I'm just praying through that myself at this point, but... Uh, I'll maybe get somebody's help with the Zoom. How do I do the split screen where you have the, the shared screen plus the, let me just see if I can see it here somewhere. Mm, I don't see it offhand. Anyway, okay, I'll just keep the shared screen there. Uh, so anyway, Long story short, uh, the Finn uh, newsletter for June, Tamina did a lovely job as usual. And I just thought maybe, uh, although we're all at different stages, perhaps in terms of baptism into the movement, uh, there are similarities. And I thought maybe we'll just go through as much of her article as what time permits. But the bigger emphasis is on comments and um, sharing different thoughts as we do that. And uh, much as with Effie's lovely Sabbath school, just the, the more comments and, and things, the better. I put the link for the article in the chat for those that are wanting to access it that way. And... Um, Anyway, the Lord, the Lord will just bless us and as we go through and, and dialogue and, and learn from each other. That's the whole goal. Can I kindly ask you to email it to us as well, please, Sister De um, Debbie? <laughs> Thank you. If you don't know. Oh, mind. David, <laughs> you, you give these lovely challenges to those of us that are a little more technologically challenged. <laughs> Okay, in that case, then I'm just going to stop the screen share for a moment and I'll do that. <laughs> you don't have to do it now, but later, I suppose. Or, but if you're doing it now, it's, it's fine as well. I was just meaning like later on. I can do it now, David, no problem. Uh, hopefully so. I shouldn't speak too quickly. And then you've, you've got it. 
and I'm not sure if any have had opportunity to uh, read it read it previously. And I'm sorry I didn't put that out as a you know oh look at this article because that many times does help us with the uh, goal of discussion. But anyway, I'm move that up. <laughs> sorry. Everything on screen share is a little different, so it makes it a little more challenging. Anyway, the topic theme is baptism, and we'll begin. Why do we have to be rebaptized? And whether it's called baptism or rebaptism at this point, we'll just leave it at that. This article will attempt to answer the question if someone who is already baptized, and so that could mean into Christianity or into Seventh-day Adventism, um, or already into this movement, uh, why are we now asserting that they need to be rebaptized? It will Assume the reader already understands the reasons for baptism as this article will not cover all the different reasons and purposes for baptism. Soon we will be addressing the Levites with this issue, many of whom will no doubt be baptized Seventh-day Adventists. And it is important that we are able to answer them correctly. And I believe Tamina makes a very good point there, one that most of us probably have already been aware of, you know, this whole thing. Huh. I've already been baptized. Why again? And I'll have helpers with the reading. Obviously, as I say, it's more about some of the commenting and, and so on, uh, as much as getting through the whole article or, or just bogging down with sort of just listening to an article. What are we baptized into? So you have already been baptized, whether that be as a Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist, or anything else. The question at hand is really, what is one baptized into? Which out of the following options do you think you were baptized into? Christ, Christianity, a church, a new movement, a new message, new truths, a new reform line. I can remember when Elder Parminder was going through this on his presentation. Anyone want to weigh in with what your thoughts were in terms of what you were being baptized into? A message. Ah, Baca. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? With all due respect, I, I see importance in each one of these aspects. Okay. And, uh, but, for me, David, uh, I'm guessing, or Effie, has said a church. Henry, every aspect. And I, I think there's validity in that uh, view. Okay, yeah. let's, let's go ahead. I was going to agree with Henry, just looking at the list. Ah, okay, Maka, yes. So we'll read through and, and maybe add some other comments as we go. Number one, Christ. If you are baptized into Christ, it might suggest, as the Bible does actually say, that you believe in him as your Savior and need to be washed of your sins, entering into a new life. Galatians 3.27, for as many... As, <clears throat> pardon me, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I made the distinction between Christ and Christianity just to present the idea of the, that if you are baptized into Christ, it might mean you do not identify with the Christian community and you simply live your life with your own Christian beliefs. And Brother David in the chat has said, are we asking about our first baptism into the Adventist church or 
those that have been baptized into the movement? And uh, that's a good question because I know my answer, what are we baptized into for early, my early baptism into Adventism likely would uh, have been probably the answer three, a church. I would have also accepted Christ, uh, Christianity, you know, as Henry said, I mean, merit in all of them. Uh, a new movement would be more what I would have zeroed in on with a new message coming with that new truths, uh, a different point in history, so new reform line for my second baptism into this movement. So anyway, number two, Christianity. If you are baptized into Christianity, then I would suggest that you are churched, but you can switch from one church to another. This could either be with an ecumenical mindset, one week worshiping at a Methodist church and the next at a Baptist church. You could identify with a Christian community but have not committed to any specific church. Alternatively, you are a Methodist for some years, then switch to a Baptist church, but see no need for rebaptism. Hebrews 10.25 identifies those Christians that do fellowship as opposed to those who do not, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of sunny, some is. And I think Jonathan in the chat did, did clarify, for the sake of the article, it is referring to our baptism into this SDA church and why people need to be rebaptized re when joining the movement. Uh, and that's sort of the way that I was taking it as well. Three, a church. If you are baptized into a specific church, then the inference would be you do need to be rebaptized if you were to switch from being a Methodist to a Baptist. And that's where profession of faith, uh, many churches, including the Adventist one, Seventh-day Adventist one, will allow people who've been baptized by immersion previously, Baptist church or any other church that uses that method, uh, to be able to stand on profession of faith just basically acknowledging new truths and, and entering the new church, AKA Seventh-day Adventist church or whatever. The concept here would be that your baptism serves as membership to a specific church. At this point, the remaining distinctions become more relevant to this movement than Christianity as a whole as we begin to consider concepts like a message movement or a new reform line, we will most often refer to ourselves as quote unquote, the message or quote unquote, the movement. We might refer to ourselves as being on the message or in the movement. And I'll maybe ask uh, Jonathan, would you be willing to read for a little bit and we'll, we'll share it around a bit as we comment. Sure. Um, alternate, alternatively, are you baptized into a movement? What actually is the difference between a new message, new movement, and a new church? Is not the new movement um, extant? I don't know what that means. Is not the new movement extant because because it has a new message and if so what is the difference between a movement and a church are they all just synonymous and we are just playing with semantics um, number five are we rebaptized because we have a new message the original mode of baptism occurs when john the baptist arrives with a new message uh, number six Another similar suggestion is that we are baptized because we have new truths. So are you baptized into new truth? 
Debbie, if you can scroll, scroll it for me. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, and I'll just quickly add the extent. I was just lo looking it up quickly. Uh, it does mean still in existence, or so coming back to that original, uh, is not the new movement extant because it has a new message. Uh, so it, the reason for its existence, in essence, okay. it's already in existence simply because of the new message. Okay, so uh, we did number six, number seven. Okay. Perhaps we are rebaptized because we are in a new reform line. And at the second way mark of some reform lines, some, some reform lines, we enter into a covenant. Could that be correct? We see baptism represented uh, at the second way mark in the Alpha of ancient Israel when they were, when they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and the Omega of ancient Israel when Christ was baptized in 27 AD. Let us investigate these options, which we will do in reverse order, so we can first cover those options which apply more to us in this movement. <clears throat> so starting with number seven, are we baptized into a new reform line and therefore because we are in a new reform line, we need to be rebaptized. We mentioned about that in the Alpha and Omega reform lines of ancient Israel. Baptism occurs at the second way mark. However, if someone is, for example, a, bapti a baptized Methodist in the 1920s and wants to join the Seventh Seventh Day Adventist Church, can you scroll up, Debbie? Oh, you're in here. Um, hey. I just have a leg. They would have to be rebaptized, re even though they are a long way from being in a new reform line. The question then is are they being rebaptized because they have learned new truths like the Sabbath or because baptism serves as a membership to a specific church? So, Jonathan, maybe just pause there for a moment. Within Adventism, People have chosen to be rebaptized at different times, right? Uh, falling away and then coming back to the Lord, and they choose to be rebaptized. Uh, and uh, people coming from a different church, rather than standing on profession of faith, they have chosen to be rebaptized, and because it's new light things like the Sabbath, et cetera, et cetera. So in the Adventist context, there were various reasons for quote unquote rebaptism, but coming to us as a movement, the need for, and I remember back in the day, it was actually being stated, at least I seem to remember at one point, it's not rebaptism, it is baptism but it, at the same time all of us were baptized the seventh day adventist so in a sense there is this is why at the beginning i said you know whether rebaptism or baptism whichever way we're not going to necessarily get into that that uh, full discussion but why is there the need for the baptism into the movement so go ahead jonathan you're doing a nice job we'll continue are we rebaptizing because we have new truths now? In 2016, we started rebaptizing people. Then in 2019, we received some major new truths. There is not going to be a, a Sunday law, and equality is the great test for the people of God, not Sabbath. Does that, does that mean that all those baptized before 2019 have to be rebaptized as now we have new, we have new truths? Do elders Parminder, Tabo, Marco, and everyone else rebaptized? before 2019 have to be rebaptized again and if we discover new truths in the future do we all need to get rebaptized yet again i think it is obvious this is not true and we have no precedent nor instruction to that effect in fact every repeating pattern has brought new truths since 1989 christ brought new truths in that john taught the messiah would be would kill the romans because they hate them but christ taught that the Romans would kill him 
and they should love them. Yet no one was rebaptized when they accepted this new truth. Number five, a new message. Are we rebaptized because we have a new message? The difference between a new message and new truths might be that the message as as the whole is made up of all the individual truths. So the latter rain message is made up of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, 9-11, 25, 20, equality, etc. But if you're baptized into a message, can you be can you be baptized into the health message? Are we told when the latter rain arrives, Seventh-day Adventists must be rebaptized re into the latter rain message? In Jones and Wagner's time, did Seventh-day Adventists have to be rebaptized into their message? So if we are not rebaptized because we have a new message or new truths, within that message, what is the difference between a movement and a message? As we have said, we seem to use the terms inter interchangeably today. Leading to number four, a new movement. A movement could be defined as a group of people with a shared purpose to create change together. And in the context of this movement, it started in 1989 with a leader. And as the individuals accepted this, me this message, and uh, which is designed to create change, collectively, they made up the movement. The change we are trying to create is to first call the Levites out of Laodicea and then the Nethanim out of Babylon. And the message we do that with is the message of equality. The Millerite movement is another example of this phenomenon. Uh, so what is the difference between a church and a movement? Okay, so what is the difference between a church and a movement? Good question. Before we continue with the article, does anyone want to weigh in with that? I'll maybe preface it with a remark. I know when I was originally baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist, the talk was, it, it, within reason, it's a church, it's a denomination, Protestant de denomination, but it, at some point, uh, and it might have been during the 1980s, it, it became, uh, well, prevalent within Adventism that Adventism was being referred to as a movement. And it was clarified by various leaders, pastors from the pulpit, leaders on the world field, in the world field, uh, you know, qualifying that we've always been a movement. It's been the Seventh-day Adventist movement. We've never been a church uh, we are a movement, and I, I believe, uh, in part, it was to highlight the growing forward, you know, walking forward kind of thought. Was it actually true? Uh, the fact that God had to raise up this movement probably would would argue the fact that it maybe wasn't so true as what some were wanting to paint it as, that it was a movement. Anyway, does anyone want to, to weigh in on that question? What is the difference between a church and a movement? Or make any I, other comment. I think the... The reason why we are baptized into a church is because the church connotation is related with that of the kingdom. A movement, you can have different movement, but not all movement, you know, will make it to heaven because the ideology that they bear in on earth cannot be carried in heaven. As with a church, the church of God, what it would constitute, will be carried to heaven. And that would be that will they constitute you know the kingdom of heaven. So I think that's why you know there's this difference in between the movement and the the church because we are a church today. We just we we call ourselves a movement because we are. I know I know that might not be the right word, but um, a branch of Adventism. But our 
uh, our denomination, you know, it's part of Adventism. Um, so I think there's a correlation somewhere here, here in between the fact that the kingdom of heaven is a church, you know, that starts on earth, but that continues in heaven, which is not the case for a movement. You know, Katya, that's a, an excellent point. What came to mind as you were talking as well was church militant and church triumphant. Uh, the word church is being utilized in spirit of prophecy. And I know family, uh, acquaintances, friends, when I was baptized into this new church uh others in my my sphere of influence that were Adventist definitely identified it as you're you're leaving seventh-day adventism you're you joined a new church you've been baptized and and the way they were perceiving it was uh In truth, right, because I, I, I identified myself in 2019. I knew I was stepping forward, and I was, in essence, as Tamina put it, you know, la leaving Laodicea. We're hoping that for the, the Levites that they'll leave the Laodicean condition, but not only that, the La Laodicean church and join Ephesus. And so it, it, it is an important distinction as you made to me, Katya. Anyone else care to read at this point? Trevor, you're a good reader. I know. Anybody else want to want to put anybody on the spot? Uh, I can read. Okay, go ahead. So we're at point three, it's the chiasm, point three of the new church. A new church with the other, oh, the yeah. difference between a church. Oh, okay, a new church. The difference between a church and a movement is that a church is organized under a church structure. Example, with officially appointed elders, Bible workers, a board, treasurer, and perhaps ministers or pastors, etc. A movement does not have to be organized in the same way as a church. It may well have overlapping characteristics. It will have leaders, maybe treasurers, but the way a church should be organized is very specific. There is one caveat to this. Caveat, sorry. And that is that the terms movement and church are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I think it is acceptable to still call ourselves a movement as well as a church because we're still trying to effect change. First in the church, then in the world. Our message is always evolving or moving, if you will. We are progressing on our way back to Eden. So if a church is progressive and still moving, it is also by definition a movement. Sister White seems clear. We are baptized into a specific church. Many have been converted and baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy uh, Ghost. Coming into the church by the ordinance of baptism. Manuscripts 26, 1902, May 1901, paragraph 48. So Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance to his spiritual kingdom. Before man can find a home in the church, before passing the threshold of God's spiritual kingdom, he is to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord, our righteousness. We can see the kingdom of God in the parable of Daniel 2 and the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, among other places. In Daniel 2, God's kingdom is depicted as a mountain. 
And indeed, kingdoms are represented by mountains in Bible symbology. Psalms 48 verse 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Obadiah 12, 1 verse 21. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. We know the context of Ellen White's writings, and when she mentions the church above, we know she's referencing the Seventh-day Adventist church, and she would not have understood it to be acceptable to be baptized into, say, the Methodist church. So while we are baptized into Christ, and we do become Christians, thereby fulfilling options one and two above, the spirit of prophecy demands more from us. We must also be identified with one specific church. This stands to reason as there is only one true church in any age. Being baptized into a specific church would mean if you are a Methodist, for example, but now want to be a Seventh-day Adventist, you would need to be re-baptized in order to publicly declare membership to that specific church. So the next logical questions might be, which church are we? If we are a new church, are we still Seventh-day Adventists? When did we become a new church? Good questions. And Levites definitely will have some of these questions. Go ahead, Brother David. I continue? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Douglas. <laughs> we baptized into Revelation 3. Revelation 2 and 3 present God's church consecutively through the ages since the cross. The Laudation church is the last church and is therefore the seven-day Adventist church, but we know it only continues until the Sunday low Weimar when it is shipwrecked. So what is God's church from the Sunday low Weimar until the second advent? Revelation 3 does not seem to show this detail. Perhaps there is a clue in the fact that it does not. Perhaps it is because the church which follows Laodicea is also identified as a seven-day Adventist church. So in the model of the seven churches of Revelation, there is no eighth church identified. We're using parable methodology. We can find this hidden church we can find this hidden church though. We know that history repeats in a line upon line fashion. So we can throw together the church of the New Testament and the church in the Old Testament in order to compare and contrast. Let's just have a look at the uh, chart there for a minute. So there's bottom line, the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, 1850 to the Sunday law for Laodicea, and paralleling the seven churches of ancient Israel, and we see where the Apis bull in, in ancient his, Israel's history uh, becomes prominent and the compromising and obviously after the Babylonian captivity the letting go of the, the uh, literal idolatry, Apis bull idolatry, but still retaining the form or letting go of the form, but not, not to, letting go of, of the more subtle uh, spiritual side of the idolatry in the mindset. So anyone want to make a comment on anything that Douglas just read or on the chart at all?
I, I can just make a comment with regards to that clarification of um, are we baptized into the church and which church it is, which church is it? So it, it kind of it kind of explains um, why we are rebaptized when we make a definition of what church we belong to. When we were baptized into the Adventist church, we were baptized into a faith of believers, a faith that had been handed down to us. Would, what would say what uh, the the, the, the definitive faith of what the Adventist church is, right? And we know that we, we who are in the movement now, uh, uh, the faith that we have, I would say is not the same faith that the Adventist church has. So that's why we make a proclamation that we are differentiating ourselves to say, okay, we don't believe like this. We believe like this and that's why we are being rebaptized. So we're kind of being, it's like a rebranding. And then once you're branded, then you, you, you can be identified based on the faith that you have, something like that. And you know, Douglas, I think what you state is very true. And that's sometimes where the ire rises in others, I'll say Adventists, that they, they do come to realize we are believing differently than general Adventism. And consequently, we are a new church and they would go to it, thus saith the Lord and a spirit of prophecy quote here, there, and everywhere that says, you know, no, no new church <laughs> and come back to us with that. But uh, what you state is, is well made, well stated. Uh, do you feel like continuing for another little bit? Yeah, I can continue. Okay. In this fashion, we can see how the Seventh-day Adventist church can parallel the Pharisaical church in the time of Christ. Laodicea is called poor, blind, and naked in Revelation 3 verse 17. By comparison, the Pharisaical church is poor in spirit, refer Matthew 5 verse 3, blind leaders of the blind in Matthew 15 verse 14, and naked in Matthew 23, when Christ calls them hypocrites. Hypocrisy can be represented by nakedness because when Adam and Eve sinned and were unclean on the inside, they too tried to cover their nakedness with their own works, paralleling the pharisaical spirit which attains to righteousness by their own works. Just as John the Baptist called the Jews out of the pharisaical church and into a completely new church, this movement is calling Adventists out of the Seventh-day Adventist church and into a completely new church. That is why you might hear us refer to our movement as Ephesus. So if it is a completely new church, why is it not depicted as the eighth church of Revelation? When the Jews were called out of the Pharisaical church and into Ephesus, they were still Jews. Ephesus was made up of Jews and Gentiles, and this church will be made up of seven-day Adventists and Nathan. The Jewish followers of Christ were still Israel, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, Romans 9 verse 6, Acts 27, shows the priests, that's Paul, and the Levites, the 273 aboard the ship of Adventism all the way until the Sunday lost shipwreck. This is, however, a parable in the Bible where this movement is openly represented. These subsets, you know, all Jews are, are not, not saved. Uh, there are subsets that 
God calls out. And what I've often said to others has been in reference to Laodicea, because I think in all honesty, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, whether conservative or liberal, but particularly the conservative on the conservative spectrum, uh, identify that there are issues within Seventh-day Adventism that, you know, that they're lacking the Holy Spirit or just, you know, dead, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, and specific issues in some cases of, of maybe some evil and corruption and so on that is, has crept in with various specific uh, church families and so on. But Laodicea is not what anyone wants to, to identify with. You read literally the verses in, in Revelation 3. And so what I often have used is saying that, you know, I've, I've come out of Laodicea. God has woken me up. He, he lets us know there's light and it's progressively more and more under the perfect day, Proverbs 4.18. And God has revealed and continued revealing new light and I'm willing to walk in. Okay, you did a lovely job reading, Douglas. Uh, does anyone else want to, to volunteer? We've got so, such good readers here, I know. <laughs> Tiffany and Maka. And anyway, anyone volunteer? If you'd like. All right. Okay, Trevor, thank you. From where? The Stone of Daniel 2. And Daniel 2, the mountain is the kingdom of God. On earth, the parable methodology demands that it cannot be the kingdom of heaven as it is being compared and contrasted to the kingdom of Satan on earth. Logic demands it too, as the stone is cut out of the mountain. Even if you claim the stone is Christ, the symbology of him being cut out of heaven is nonsensical. If like we do, if like we do, you claim the stone represents the priests and the Levites, then the mountain still has to be the kingdom of God on earth or the church on earth. The term cut out then makes sense as it is a reference to the harvest where the wheat is cut out of the field. So at the end of the world, the mountain represents the Seventh-day Adventist church. And as we have said, the stone represents the priests and the Levites being called out or cut out or harvested from the mountain. When the stone hits the feet of the statue, it represents the loud crying, bringing down Babylon. After the Sunday law, the statue is Babylon from the head to the feet because Daniel 2.38 says, Thou Nebuchadnezzar art this head of gold. That was a, a real epiphany to me. I know way back when, you know, the, this concept of, of Babylon continued right from the days of Babylon, the literal, literal kingdom, right through down to our day. And it opened up my thinking and my understanding even of some of these other concepts in terms of, and we know that Levites particularly, this, this kingdom of God on earth being the, the mountain, the mountain being the kingdom of God on earth. Most Adventists by this point in time have encountered the Adventist new teaching, and it really was a new teaching uh, at one point about it. To the mountain representing uh, Christ and or the mountain representing the kingdom of heaven. That was more the, the usual uh, thought. So it's going to be an argument that Levites will come for, forward with. You're wrong. It's not the kingdom 
of God on earth. It's the kingdom of God in heaven, or it's Christ representing the mountain, or the mountain representing Christ. Go ahead, Trevor. Then when you are in the dispensation of the toes, which are the ten kings or the governments of the world being directed by Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17.5, so our new church is represented in scripture by the stone of Daniel 2. The priests and the Levites separating completely from the Seventh-day Adventist church, hitting the feet of the statue with the loud cry, the and bringing down modern Babylon. Then when Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, Revelation 18.2, the Nethanim come out of her represented by the wheat. Where do we see the wheat coming out of the statue? It does not say it is, it does not say it is in the surface texts, but using the model of agriculture, Daniel 2.35 says, the statue became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. In the natural model, chaff is represented from wheat. So if you have chaff in the surface text and you understand natural spiritual parable methodology, then I feel like you went up instead of down. Then you know wheat. Oh. Has to the other side. Then you know wheat has to be present in the parable, even if it does not appear in the service text. This Pause there, Trevor, just for a second. Forgive me to interject, and please, others, you know, enter in uh, to make a comment. Uh, this, to me, is one of the highlights of parable methodology, the hidden information. And this, this concept, I can still remember when Elder Parminder was, was bringing it out. This concept that you've got chaff mentioned. Duh. Of course, there's got to be wheat. You know, it, it's so simple. A, a child can understand it. And yet, this is the beauty of parable methodology that things that we weren't even thinking of, like thinking through, you know, because in, in a sense, it's, it's a matter of just sort of thinking about it, reasoning it through and realizing, yeah, well, of course, there's going to be wheat. If you've got chaff, you've got to have wheat. But it's, it's the beauty of the transformation God has done in our thinking to help us to understand. And you know, the, the baptism into this new church, the baptism into a movement almost would be warranted just on our eyes being opened greater to parable methodology and, and how to really read scripture correctly and spirit of prophecy correctly and, and take in all the, the other factors, the context and the audience and, and original intent and etc cetera, etc cetera. so sorry Trevor I just wanted to interject that because just as you were reading it it was it was like that duh kind of moment for me go ahead this process happens during the harvest time so when Babylon the great has fallen has fallen fully and finally at Daniel 12 1 the wheat the Nathanians that came out of her under the loud cry and the chaff were separated. Thus, under the midnight cry, the priests are called out of Laodicea, who then call the Levites out of Laodicea, who then, under the loud cry, call the Nephilims out of Babylon. This is the other way one could prove to Adventists that the stone is not Christ. After the stone hits the statue, it falls, and only then does the wheat come out of her. Adventists will agree the wheat represents God's people, but it is impossible that God's people come out of her after the second advent, as the world is destroyed at the second advent. And Adventists would be forced to agree that the wheat comes out of her at the loud cry, though, as it says so in the plain surface of Revelation.
equation 18.4. So that's basically saying that the wheat comes out of the statue when the stone hits it. So if the stone is Christ, Christ comes after the close of probation, therefore no wheat could come out. But if the stone's the 144,000, the wheat can be called out before the close of probation and before the second coming of Christ. Very well synopsized, Trevor. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's logical, right? Do we, did we in the past ever really think that all through? No, but wonderful that God has, has opened up this new way of looking at things and new thinking and, and obviously parable methodology being the, the crux. But go ahead, Trevor, if you feel comfortable still reading a little bit more. We'll, we'll only read a, a wee bit more perhaps. But. So when was the start of spiritual Ephesus? This message calls God's people out of Laodicea and this message began in 1989. So in 1989, the stone of Daniel 2 started to be cut out from the mountain. This is when God first unsealed parable methodology with reform lines, line upon line. The next move away from a thus saith the Lord methodology was the symbolic application of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Despite Sister White's endorsement of Uriah Smith's literal interpretation, then 9-11 followed by a further move away from a plain thus saith the Lord when the much prohibited doctrine of the time setting was reestablished. That's a, a, a good phrasing. The much prohibited doctrine of time setting because probably many of us held to that doctrine. <laughs> time setting, time no longer. You know. So okay. to, to re-enter was a real stumbling block for many, as well as organization. Go ahead, Trevor. Anyone who has accepted even just these doctrines, which by the way, I think is a vast majority, if not everyone who has fallen away since the first temple cleansing in 2014 has apparently unknowingly already accepted the parable methodology and rejected a, thus, a plain thus saith the Lord. Hence, there should be no argument that we are a progressive church required to keep moving toward Eden until the very end of our line. Amen. And I think we all have to leave it there. We get into couple of the reform lines uh, and other things in the article, but I encourage all of us to, to continue reading through if we hadn't done already. And whatever stage that people are at in terms of baptism, you know, we're now I'm generalizing in terms of the world field even, uh, we need to be praying that the logistics, as the, the pandemic and things open up and so on, will, will allow that in a timely fashion and in an orderly way. And, and I think Elder Parminder made, made the comment, not enough uh, leaders at this point in the world field to accommodate uh, the, the baptisms, I mean, only a few are able to baptize members and travel restrictions obviously are just in the process now of starting to open up. But, and for those of us that have already previously been baptized uh, into this new church, uh, just how God would have us proceed in terms of the baptismal vows and, and studying to show ourselves approved unto God. Uh, we can be holding each other up in prayer and, and uh, 
and pray for those like Katya and others that are leading out with some of the baptismal studies uh, and those who are studying. So we can be holding all of that up in prayer at this point in time. So that is where I'll end at this point. And Henry, you get to have the closing off and the closing prayer. Uh, so we'll, we'll allow you to do that and uh, put our schedule back up. Uh, we just, oh, we can do it this way. Perhaps, yes. Just so that it's seen a little bit better as to how we proceed. So Henry, are you there? Just... Yes, I'm here. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I lost all my participants. Yep. Go ahead. All right. So what we'll do is we'll have a closing song for now. Okay, closing remark and prayer, I guess. But um Okay, I'll still have a song as well. And uh, the song is uh, 322, so I'll just share that. And Henry, I'll just stop the recording now. Forgive me, I should have done it a moment yeah. ago. Done. Okay. Okay, it is nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, out of this world of so dream, I have renounced all sin for pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Be perfect, let nothing be true. Nothing between my dreamly pleasures. Habits of life, though I must face must not my heart from him as a savior. He is my own, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my savior. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep away clear, let nothing be clean. Nothing between your many hearts and ears. Through the whole world, I think you can be. I'm going to bless, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen. 
Okay, um, so we will have a closing prayer at this point and then we'll break for lunch. And um, how is that going to work? We're still going to um, join again at uh, 2 o'clock. Yes, Henry, 2 o'clock uh, Alberta time. So an hour and 15 minutes, basically, from whatever time zone you're in right now for the lunch break. Okay, very good. So just again, okay, 2 o'clock, uh, it's the Alberta time. That's when we're going to rejoin. So we'll just uh, close off now with a prayer. And I think that we're still recording, so you probably want to turn that off.